Hypocrisy, arrogance and pervasive duplicity are all words one could just as easily relate to the government of colonial Britain as you could to Britain's government today. The only difference being you can add rank incompetence to the pile now too. That is, if you couldn't before anyway. London and much of the southeast of England have, of course, been plunged into a hastily concocted new tier, Tier 4, giving the affected population less than eight hours' notice. Hardly world-beating, or a moonshot attempt at handling the virus which has gripped the world. It is also most certainly not a display of the viral tide being turned in 12 weeks, as we were initially promised. It feels as though the UK population has been trapped in a long protracted sigh, followed by what else could go wrong, before promptly being presented with yet another chaotic attempt at leadership. If this is their attempt at leadership, I'd hate to see what their zero effort option looks like. This episode, of course, is drawing upon the news that Christmas has been cancelled for many, as much of the UK enters this neo-lockdown in the form of Tier 4. However, what we will be applying might at first appear more than a little tangential. Given that this week we've focused on Orientalism, particularly how it transforms modes of knowledge production, in this episode we'll be looking to discuss how this colonial attitude has had this epistemological effect then but also how it might have impacted thinking now. This colonial reformulation of knowledge has not only impacted how the British state, for example, sees the other, but also how it sees itself in relation to those it governs. A sense of abject, violent entitlement used to oppress the others of colour is being co-opted in the Johnson administration's attempt to lay the tier four blame at anybody else's door but their own. In Paul Stevens and Rolls Sapra's article Akbar's Dream, Mogul Toleration and English-British Orientalism, they define historicism in a number of ways. Our interest is in historicism in this secondary sense, which it needs to be emphasised is not history, but a way of thinking that produces history. It is not simply a record, reconstruction or inquiry into the past, but a philosophy that comprehends past, present and future as one, a process that assumes progress and development, a master narrative that insists on an overarching unified meaning, and in some cases, a science that hopes to discover the laws of history, end quote. Historicism, in this sense, is that of the Enlightenment. It is this continual progress of society through time. It is, in the words of Boris Johnson, the journey towards becoming world-beating, the striving towards a moonshot ideal. This is the thinking that informed the subjugation of British colonies. It is that which separated the civilised from the uncivilised, the human from the savage, the British from the non-British, the norm from the other. What also characterises this thinking is inevitability, as though the future is set in stone, as though the enlightenment of the colonised is not only necessary, but bound to happen as though we knew in March that we'd be in this tier four chaos now. It positions those in power as having absolute power and yet zero responsibility. It makes them agents of change and yet simultaneously subjects of it. Historicism in this definition is then both empowering and disempowering. In terms of how this thinking impacts the exercise of power, Stevens and Sapra refer to the ideas of a colonial administrator by the name of Sir William Jones. Jones was scrutinised at length by post-colonial thinkers such as Edward Said. The following quote is taken from their article and relates to British colonialism in India. Stevens and Sapra note that Jones was a liberal rationalist, an Enlightenment philosopher. Indians should have their own laws, he felt, but only after they had been digested recovered and reordered by reason, that is, by Western rationalism. Indians themselves were unfit for the task. As Jones explained to an American friend, they are incapable of civil liberty. Few of them have any idea of it, and those who have do not wish it. They must, I deplore the evil, but know the necessity of it. 
they must be ruled by an absolute power. End quote. What this points to, then, is the infantilization of the colonial subject, whilst also framing them as a savage. The Indian, in this colonial framework, is incapable of the haughty levels of reason as the British one. They are, therefore, in need of saving. This salvation comes in the form of being ruled absolutely, and without consent first given, but rather as implied by their position. Relating this back to Tier 4, the British subjects are, according to ministers both last night and this morning, being irresponsible for leaving Tier 4 areas before the lockdown came into effect at midnight this morning. They are, apparently, incapable of understanding the risks, and so fines will be enforced by the police, who are now positioned at major train stations, ready to chastise and exert this absolute power. Now, what I am not trying to do is compare the position of the colonised subject to the British subject today. Their positions are clearly not the same, nor are they comparable. But what is comparable is the mentality of the relevant governments. The British state then, and the British state now, are both attempting to avoid blame, hold the governed responsible for the actions of the government, displaying rank hypocrisy, and both justify their oppressive means through a rhetoric of inevitability. Again, to reiterate so as to reinforce the point, the position of the colonised is not comparable to British subjects during coronavirus. But Orientalism has clearly impacted how the state operates. Its abject sense of Occidental entitlement is now being both admitted outwards towards its own definition of the Orient and inwards towards the Occidental subject. Colonialism and Orientalism has had a profound impact on the knowledge produced by the state to justify its own actions. But if you ever needed an example of a state doing things it explicitly said it wouldn't do, whilst constructing an other to push the blame onto, the virus, the tier four traveller, at Christmas, etc., then you need not look further than Britain today. This marks the end of the 14th episode of Deadful Sundays. We hope you enjoyed it, and that we'll see you in the new year. Merry Christmas and a happy new year. Here's to 2021. What else could go wrong? <laughs>